Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Alan Stamauer. We're just going to give a few more moments for everybody to join us and come into the room. Again, thank you everybody for joining us today. Uh, this is Alan Stattmauer at Amplify. We'll be discussing um, parity between English and Spanish assessments in M-Class. Uh, if you would, while we're waiting for everybody to join us, uh, could you please um, introduce yourselves in the chat? Uh, let us know who you are, what you're most curious about today. And we'd actually love to understand also if you um, are already familiar with M-Class in English or if you're completely new to our assessment and instruction system. So again, please uh, share with everyone in the chat. Um, who are you? Please introduce yourself, what you're most curious about, and um, whether or not you're already familiar with M-Class or you're coming to us fresh today. Welcome, Pamela. And we appreciate, don't worry, we'll be starting from the most basic element to introduce you to M-Class. Who else is with us today? Uh, uh, Tisa, welcome, also completely new. Oh, fantastic. Um, Alexandra, welcome. Uh, Porsche, wonderful, wonderful, coming from California. A lot of new people. Okay, I'm glad that we plan to you know, introduce M-Class as a whole and not just the Spanish. So when we talk about parity between English and Spanish, we'll be learning about English and Spanish in M-Class. Ah, oh, welcome uh, from Oregon, from Nebraska, from Maryland. All right, if anybody else is here, please uh, join us and let me begin. We'll start talking about our agenda. I'll introduce myself again. I'm Alan Stadnauer. I'm the Vice President of uh, Assessment and Intervention at Amplify. Um, while I can speak passable Spanish. I'll be doing most of the English portion today. And I'm being joined by um, Kajal Patel Bilo, who's our Vice President of Spanish Solutions. Uh, and together, uh, we're going to present both the English and the Spanish in M class. Now, what we're going to do is talk first about M class as a whole, as an instruction assessment and instruction system, um, with its foundation in Dibble's eighth edition to assess for English literacy skills. Kajal will then chat about the research on assessment in Spanish, walk us through our newest product, M-Class Lectura, and then we will take combined, we will take you live through a demo, a demo of how we assess in English and in Spanish and support instruction and parents in both of these. Now for Q&A, you'll notice at the bottom of your screen, there is a specific, not just the chat, but Q&A button please ask us questions at any time. We'll try to answer um, type answers as we go along, uh, but we'll also take live questions, especially the really major ones and common questions. We'll leave some time at the end for uh, answering questions. Um, I would say I kind of know in advance, most of your questions are gonna probably be about Lat Cagel's um, section on Spanish. Feel free to try to stump her, uh, it's pretty hard. Uh, but please ask us questions as we go along. So let's start with M class in general with a focus on English literacy to kind of set the stage for the parity discussion. Now we've been doing this work for, for two decades. Uh, we initially launched M class with Dibbles on a Palm pilot back in 2001, it had a 160 by 160 pixel screen, which is probably a tiny little corner of your smartphone. And I'm sure nobody who's joining us today actually remembers using them, but uh, both Kajal and I do. Uh, over the years, as the research on literacy has really advanced and the research on assessment has advanced, uh, we felt that we need to keep refreshing. And as we are in 2022, uh, we have now um, M class with Dibble's eighth edition in English and coming right now, literally launching in a couple of months, uh, we'll have M class Lectura in Spanish. 2.4 million students nationwide are being assessed with the M class system. And I wanna focus in on just one of them. 
you'll meet a bunch more students who come from Spanish speaking homes or otherwise are learning both Spanish and English very shortly. But let's meet a child that every one of us already knows, um, Evan. Uh, Evan is in the Easton Elementary School. He is a native English, English speaker. His home language is in English. We're teaching him in English and that's the goal of his literacy program. And while he doesn't know any other languages, um, Easton is a school where there are many students who speak Spanish, many students who speak other languages. So of course he hears a lot at recess, but he is a student where we wanna see how is he doing his English language progression. And his teacher wants to know a bunch of different things at any given moment in time. Of course, the most important thing she wants to know in, in literacy screening is where is he? Is he on track, off track? Is he reading at grade level? Does he need additional support uh, and the like? So she administers M class with him. Now to set the big stage is M class is teacher administered and digitally scored. What we mean by that is that this is a moment where we're not putting children on computers for their assessment. A teacher has a device in her hand and the student often has printed materials, um, but not always. It depends on the particular measure and skill that we're assessing. It's a series of one minute measures. Each measure is fully and thoroughly going to assess one, sometimes even two, foundational literacy skills. And this world is very gentle on students because in five to seven minutes, they are finished and they go back to their work. We're not putting them for half an hour or an hour on a computer every month, three times a year, five to seven minutes, one-on-one -on -one with a teacher. They love and appreciate that time between the benchmarks, progress monitoring for those who need it takes two minutes and the student can read a book they could use amplifier reading, whatever it is. Now, M class is also very gentle on teachers. So, you know, you might think for a moment that that's going to take them a little bit longer to finish assessing their whole class. But what they really are gaining in that moment is an extremely intuitive and holistic understanding of every child as a reader. So the child is not the number. First, they're the reader, and the teacher witnesses this themselves. The result of this is that it's incredibly transparent. Teachers trust the data. And when the time comes for them to read the reports, it takes them a very small amount of time. Um, they're not reading them cold. They already have that intuition. And now they want the quantitative information to go along the qualitative information. Arguably, the best way to know if a child can read an S is to put an S in front of them and let them go give them a word, let them segment it, put a connected text, let them read aloud. Um, this focus on productive skills means that it's really explicit and we understand not what a child could do in multiple choice or in silent reading, but can they read? Can they make the sounds? Can they read the words? It also means, because you could do a lot of items in a minute, as we'll see, teachers get extremely granular data. So the heart of M class on the English side is the gold standard Dibbles eighth assessment from the University of Oregon. Extraordinarily well-researched, Dibbles has been in, in, in play for 30 years. Dibbles eighth edition is about four years old, um, based upon the most recent uh, research as we've talked about in use very, very widely. Uh, and one of its really outstanding features is it's designed not only to tell us which students are at risk, but also be rooted in a skills progression that will give us granular sub-skill information, not just can they decode, but where do they get stuck? It also is pretty much the only assessment out there that was validated in its initial research, not only for universal screening of literacy, but also for dyslexia screening. So it's an all-in-one tool. As I've mentioned, in M-Class, Dibbles 8 is broken into a series of one-minute measures. We can see them in the top half of the chart. And this is gonna cover all of our foundational literacy skills that people need um, and in order to assess risk and really get instructional utility. And it changes from grade to grade. Below it, we see four additional valuable measures that were developed in research to amplify and we can turn these on for you. It's no, no additional cost 
but we let you configure your whole screening program by using D8 and then whichever ones are the additional measures you need for dyslexia screening or for instruction. So that's the world of NPLAS. We're gonna see what this looks like in practice in just a little while, but let's think about what teachers need when they're either cultivating Spanish literacy skills or where they have many students in their classes who are native Spanish speakers. So with that, Kajal, how about if you share, and again, of course, as we turn over to Kajal, I remind everybody, feel free to put questions into the Q&A box at the bottom, and I'll be responding to things while Kajal is sharing. Thank you, Alan. So give me one moment while I transition. Okay. Here we go. So um, as Alan mentioned, I'm Kajal Bila, VP of Spanish Solutions at Amplify. Welcome everybody today. And so let's let's take a look at four students. These are four student profiles of, of, of uh, what could be many, many more students. And Alan already introduced us to Evan. So Evan is in Mr. Engel's class. Um, in addition to Evan in, Ingles, in, in Mr. Ingalls' class, we have Ines. Ines is also in Mr. Ingalls' class. She's a first grader who began at the school midway through kindergarten, just having moved to the U.S. from Nicaragua. Her family speaks Spanish at home, and she's been learning English at school in an ESL pullout model because this particular school, Easton Elementary, that both uh, Evan and Ines attend uh, is an English immersion school. So all the students are learning in, in English and uh, Inez is receiving supports through an ESL pullout model, spending a portion of each day receiving instruction in English as, um, as a new language. And this is a very prevalent model in the US. <clears throat> in addition, we have another school, Springdale Elementary, which is a dual language immersion school. And uh, we In that school, we have Gabrielle and Tessa, and I'll introduce you to Gabrielle and Tessa in a moment. But the dual language school that they're in, this is one of a growing number of dual language immersion programs in the U.S. In response to the growth in Spanish-speaking students in the U.S., dual language programs have grown tremendously in the last several years. About 10 years ago, there were only about 200 across the U.S., and now there are more than 3,000, and they're continuing to grow. And while the English immersion models are prevalent, we have this amazing growth in dual language programs as well. So let's take a look at Gabrielle and Tessa, who are both students at, um, at Springdale Elementary with the dual immersion program. Gabrielle is in first grade in Ms. Brown's dual language classroom. He's always lived in the community, and he began school in kindergarten. His family speaks Spanish at home, but he has English at home too, because his older cousins have been going to school and they are there a lot and speaking with him more in English. His mother, who grew up in Peru, was thrilled to find a dual language program that would support his continued learning in Spanish um, while he's learning English. And so in his school, Ms. Brown provides 80% of the instruction in Spanish and 20% in English. And as he goes through uh, additional grades, that proportion will shift. Um, Tessa is one of his classmates um, and, she, and her family speaks English at home. She attended uh, 3K and pre-K in the community. And as soon as she turned five, her father entered the lottery for a spot, a coveted spot in the dual immersion program. So now she is learning Spanish as a second language starting in kindergarten and um, is also receiving 80% of her, of her instruction in Spanish and 20% in English. So, we have four different types of students here in two different types of programs, but let's focus for a moment on Inez and Gabriel. So both of them have language skills in Spanish. This is an asset as well as their language, as well as, well as their heritage and their culture. Gabriel even already has some bilingualism because of the time that he's spending with his cousins speaking English. Um, and we know that students' home language is the foundation for their English development because Spanish and English have many connections. There's evidence of cross-linguistic transfer of skills from Spanish to English, linguistic skills such as phonological awareness and alphabetic knowledge measured in Spanish are correlated with the same skills in English. And from research, we also know that bilingualism can improve cognitive skills and give students an academic advantage in other subject areas and improve prospects in the job market. 
But despite that strong and rich foundation and the opportunity that it offers as a country, we are struggling to serve students like Inez and Gabrielle. As a nation, we are seeing 77% uh, percent of, of Latino students um, uh, are, are not proficient readers by fourth grade. And we all know that if a student isn't a proficient reader by fourth grade, their long-term outcomes are, are likely to be limited. And 42% are, are, um, are being served for a specific learning disability. Do they really have a learning disability? That's a high percentage. And so these current outcomes are deeply unfair to these students. And so we have to ask, how are we assessing Spanish students' literacy skills? There we go, my slide was not catching up with me. How are we assessing students, uh, Spanish speaking students' literacy skills? A 2019 study by University of Oregon researchers uh, with native Spanish speaking pre-K students uh, was conducted. And these students were assessed for phonological awareness skills, which is the ability to identify the first sounds um, in, in spoken words um, was the task that they were given. And when they were assessed in English, 63% were identified as needing tier two or tier three intervention. Now, when those same students were assessed in Spanish, that number dropped significantly to 21%. So we can see immediately that assessing in Spanish gives a more accurate and complete picture of a student's skills and what they can do. And that is what is needed to drive the right interventions. And educators know this, and they've been, they've been asking for the right assessment. Um, they want, educators want to see parity with English solutions. They want the content and word choice. They've been asking for the content and word choice to be more culturally responsive. The passages need to reflect the student's background and lived experiences. They want research-backed measures based on how literacy develops in Spanish, not an adaptation or translation of what the English measures are. And overall, a unified representation of a student's biliteracy. And so we have heard educators and committed ourselves to achieving exactly this. We brought together a team of nationally recognized experts to work with our literacy learning scientists, um, Dr. Lillian Duran from the University of Oregon, Dr. Doris Baker from University of Texas, Dr. Gisela O'Brien, Dr. Elsa Cardenas Hagen, as well as educators from several school districts who are on the ground working with students every day. And the result is M-Class Lectura, which we are thrilled to be launching. It is designed from the ground up based on the latest research on how students learn to read in Spanish. We have three years of research in, in development invested, and that's going to continue. We have parity with the English assessment in terms of user experience, instructional tools and content, reporting, grade coverage, and it drives instructional decisions for Spanish literacy. And when it is used with Dibble's eighth edition, we have the full picture of the students by literacy. For Dibble's, we know that Dibble's eighth edition tells us what a student's literacy skills are in English and Lectura tells us those for Spanish. And when we put them together, we have that full picture of by literacy. So let me give you a sneak peek of that. Um, I'm going to show you this report in more detail in a moment, but just want to preview that what we have here is a picture. This is a, a picture of Gabrielle's by literacy development, um, side by side view of performance in English and Spanish and what what the performance, what what his literacy skills in Spanish mean for his literacy skills in English. So let's talk about the assessment behind that. And then I promise I will show that report in more detail later. So what we see with Dibble's eighth edition and Lectura is the same foundational skills, but they are assessed differently. For instance, so, so we start with the um, letter naming and phonological awareness in the earlier grades, moving into alphabetic principle decoding, and then moving into fluency and comprehension in the later grades. And so you see many similarities across the skills and you see some differences, which I will highlight in Spanish, for instance, phonological awareness in Spanish, in, it includes syllable level scoring. 
as opposed to in Dibble's eighth edition where that is phoneme level scoring. The fact that Spanish has a consistent syllabic structure means that students learning to read in Spanish may sometimes be working with syllables as the, as the smallest instructional unit, as opposed to English, where the less consistent letter sound correspondences require attention at that individual phoneme level. Both are important and our measures are designed accordingly. In addition, letter sounds are assessed uh, in Spanish, again, due to the more transparent letter to sound connection. And we also are piloting two other measures uh, that uh, are also represented as differences here on uh, for the Spanish assessment on the slide. And uh, this is in the area of comprehension, as well as in phonological awareness. The research uh, demonstrates, for, in, for instance, here for comprehension in first grade, the research demonstrates that because of that transparency uh, in the letter sound connection with Spanish, students decoding progresses pretty fast. And it can, because of the, the decoding progressing uh, more quickly, it is possible that the, that the decoding skills can outpace the comprehension skills. So it is really important to continue to monitor those comprehension skills. And also the, the phonological awareness measure that is available in second grade um, has some predictive value in terms of outcomes. And so that is there as well for teachers. So we're going to now show you what we're talking about. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Alan because we are going to demo both Dibble's eighth edition as well as Lectura. We're going to start with Dibble's eighth edition. So I'm going to turn it back over to Alan so that he can demonstrate. I hope everybody is uh, is enjoying. Now that we've understood the big ideas behind our Spanish and our English assessments, let's take a look at what this actually feels like. So first I'm going to demo um, the English experience and then Cadrill is gonna show us the Spanish experience. So let's start at the beginning. I described that this is a one minute measure where teachers and students sit side by side. Uh, we are meeting um, Karen and Lee. Lee's a first grade student at the beginning of the year doing the English phoneme segmentation fluency. So let's watch a little bit. We'll start with a practice item. I'll pause periodically and narrate and then I'll abridge it. So let's, um, let's take a listen. The sounds in the word am are a, m. Mm. Your turn. Tell me the sounds in the word am. Tell me any sounds you hear. Uh, a. So the first of what's going on is that Mr. Say, the little Pac-Man creature, is giving Karen the instructions exactly to show uh, Lee. So that way there's absolute consistency between teachers in terms of the instructions and the assessment. Uh, we're looking at her iPad. Uh, it could be a Chromebook with a touch screen. It could even be a laptop with a mouse. Uh, and um, let's take it. Okay, here is your first word. Four. Uh, er. Here. So what we're seeing is that it's a one minute measure and the timer's counting up. It'll flash yellow five seconds before the end to keep it simple and easy for Karen. Beneath it is the word that she's saying and asking him to segment. And the additional items are coming up right over there on the screen if she wants to know what's coming up. Beneath it are the correct phonemes, huh, ear. Now he said, huh, e ear. So she tapped underneath the H, tapped underneath the ear, and then tapped the phoneme to indicate he made a mistake. A double tap would be a self-correction. I'm going to be zipping all the way forward near the end where we can see what happens with this onset rhyme. And instead of the tap tap, there's going to be a tap and then dragging in the case where he does not segment uh, the phonemes. We'll see how she uses her finger almost like a pencil or her mouse, that is. Ask. Uh, ask. So we saw the first sound. First. And then he did not segment. Uh, ask. Bring. Onset rhyme. Bring. Five second warning. And then Stop. that last item, he did not segment. So the assessment ends. Every kid wants to know how they did. And that's the key there is because Karen now has the score instantaneously on her device. So Lee, who was doing very well on his letter names, only segmented 23 segments correctly in a minute. 
Now that's well below the benchmark for the beginning of the year first grade. You could just imagine how many words might be being asked in a minute when you don't have to do anything multiple choice. So she's got the score on two measures. She'll then go on and do letter sounds and decoding with nonsense word fluency, the score will appear. Word reading, score, oral reading fluency score. And then we will get an overall composite score. This is predicting future reading risk. So what that's gonna mean is it's gonna come up in the same four categories, um, red, yellow, green, blue. We'll see them in the score reports in a moment and I'll explain them. But it's telling us whether Lee is likely to be reading at the end of grade one on track unless he gets or with, if he's only in the core, does he need extra support? Now, at the middle of the year, Lee's gonna do the same assessment and Karen was able to see the scores coming all the way in from the beginning. So they could really take advantage of that moment to have a one-on-one -on -one teacher student conference, which again is why this is so gentle on teachers and students. We'll shift over to Andy Brown's first grade class when she finishes that middle of the year assessment for 15 students. Now, what we're trying to do with M class is really empower teachers to make their own discoveries about the data of this and the needs of their class and of individual students, not send them to lots of different reports, but allow them to work live as they discover or in data team meetings or MTSS meetings. And then also we'll see in the instruction tab, have an instantaneous now what? What can I do instructionally tomorrow? Um, and that's gonna be the tension that we wanna bring here. So the first thing that Andy sees is her whole class summary. 15 students were assessed at the middle of the year and five of them, about a third, were below and well below the benchmark. But this means that these two students, if we didn't give them intervention and intensive support, they would only have a 20% chance of reading on track at the end of the year. So the, the structure in the M class is to be predictive of future reading success. These seven students who are at the benchmark, they have an 80% chance of a success. We should just support them through the core. And those who are above the benchmark probably even do enrichment. And then of course we have our students who do need some strategic support. We quickly see the foundational skills as they are across the class. So I could think about my small groups. I could think about my whole class instruction. But what I really wanna know, what Ms. Brown really wants to know is how are all the students doing? Everything is sortable and clickable. So here are those two students in need of intensive support. If I'm curious about my decoding or my word reading, let's say the word reading, here are my students who really need support on the word reading, but since the foundational skills are read left to right, I know immediately who is still struggling and needs support on precursor skills and who like Emmy is doing all right on the precursor skills and is ready for her word reading. And really she's running below the expectations for first grade level, but I know where I'm up to. When I click on a letter, I get that transparency and trust that teachers want, as well as that granularity. She scored 49 phonemes correct on that phonemic awareness. And here I see the transcript of it looks just like you saw on the device with Karen and Lee. And we see that she was pretty flawless segmenting these words. When I look at how she was doing on her word reading though, I start seeing that she only scored 15, 14 correct and I can quickly see which words she's been scoring incorrectly on. And this is what she needs a lot of work on. If I look at her oral reading fluency, it does not surprise me that with those word reading scores, here she really needs a lot of help, both on accuracy and fluency. She did not get very far in a minute and we can see the errors she made. If I drill down further into Emmy, I would have a historical background, I would have progress monitoring graphs. We won't go into those. Those only take a minute for a student. So those are very efficient. But what Ms. Brown really wants is the immediate now what? Because she may not have time to analyze every child. And that's where we get to the instruction tab. Here, M class went deeper than the skill scores and analyzed the sub skill patterns for every child. So for Emmy, M class noticed that for word reading, she was struggling with the two syllable words that worked out the pattern. In her oral reading fluency, again, it was the endings. It was the two syllable words that were challenging. 
There are lessons that you can do with ME, but a lot of teachers, when they see even all of these subskill patterns, there's so much here, especially if you think about our rootedness in science of reading and teachers, especially new teachers might be at the beginning of their trajectory. And so with all this information, what's the one thing ME needs next? There it is in plain English. Work on her decoding of more complex patterns. Every student, Emmy's Samir, well below the benchmark, his patterns, what he needs. Anna is at grade level proficiency, but she also has learning needs. And even Aiden, we see his patterns, lessons that are appropriate for him, and he should be working on his comprehension skills. Each child was then placed into a targeted reading group. It might not be a small group because my class can have 75% of students having the same need. As a teacher, I want that. Every time there's new data, every benchmark, every progress monitoring, the analysis is done again. We update the recommendations. And then here we are, we see Emmy's group. Again, we're in English literacy. We'll see Spanish literacy in a moment. English literacy, we see Emmy needs to work on re reading words with more complex patterns in a group of five students, what they can do, what they need to do. Pedagogy, so valuable for so many teachers who need their own scaffolding. There are English learners in the group. How can you think about adjusting the lessons we're about to give you for your English learners, Spanish speakers, but also other languages? And then if you have students in your group who speak a language variety at home, that may not be the general English in school. Perhaps they speak Appalachian English uh, or Black English or any one of the over 100 language varieties of English spoken by students at home and outside school. Those have rigorous grammars, and we really want to help you be able to teach them how to read and decode the text of school. So we want to give you guidance and advice for that. And then here's that pattern of two syllable words. And there, Ms. Brown is being given a series of 10 to 20 minute activities to focus on that skill. These are written to be very scripted, minimal preparation in order to be able to really get into that instruction immediately with your students. So again, we're gonna turn it over to Kajal, especially so we can see Spanish, but also that dual language, those students who need both languages. We'll see how that plays out. But here, what I really wanna emphasize is you've got that balance between rapid assessment, granularity, transparency, clarity. The ability for teachers and data teams and MTSS groups to figure out for themselves what children need, but then have M-Class scaffold it with instant analysis at the subskill pattern, instant targeted groups, and a series of lessons that teachers could use in the morning. And with that, let's look at the parity with Spanish. Thank you, Alan. Okay. So as Alan showed with Dibble's eighth edition, this is what it looks like for the teacher and student. You'll see that it's the same experience as with Dibble's eighth edition. Uh, what we have different is some different materials, right? Um, so, but so on the left, you see a syllable segmentation task. So that is a different type of skill, as I mentioned earlier, that we measure syllable segmentation instead of phoneme segmentation. The materials that you see on the right, uh, on the left, you see a syllable sounds measure, and that's actually what I'm going to show you in just a moment. And on the right, you see a passage, aviones de papel, um, which is an oral reading fluency passage. So I'm going to now show you, demonstrate a measure this is the syllable sounds measure. And what the student is going to do is read these syllables. And it will start with the teacher instructions and then continue the teacher instructions to the student and then the student will begin the, begin the task. Hola, Sonia, ¿cómo estás? Bien. Aquí hay algunas sílabas. Cuando yo señale una sílaba, tú vas a leerla en voz alta. Practiquemos. Esta sílaba es des. Tu turno. ¿Cómo se dice? Des. Así es. Esta sílaba es des. Dime todas las sílabas que puedas. Cuando yo diga comienza, empieza aquí. 
y sigue a través de la página. Lee cada sílaba a medida que las señales. Si encuentras una, una sílaba que no conoces, yo te la diré. Pon tu dedo en la primera sílaba. ¿Estás lista? Sí. Empieza. Con, fu, fi, som, za, va, vi, tu, ba, ler, lad, vo, co, si, po. So you can see, as Alan had described um, in, the, in, the, in the previous measure that was shown with Karen, that the teacher is able to mark where the student makes an error, but also self-corrects. And so with LAD, we see that the teacher was able to mark it wrong at first, but then quickly self-corrected and marked LOL incorrect. You see that we have the same timer and the teacher will then continue with the student as, as the student reads the words and afterward will receive a score. So let's take a look at what the reporting looks like when complete. And so when, when, a, when a teacher logs into M-Class, the teacher will see the English assessment under reading and the Spanish assessment under Espanol. So I'm going to click Espanol. And you're familiar with this report. This looks just like it did in Dibble's eighth edition, uh, but it has the Spanish skills up at the top. And as I scroll down to the bottom again here, we see our list of students. We have Gabriel here. I can take a look at how Gabriel performed on individual measures. In particular, I'm going to look at syllable segmentation. And I can see the kinds of errors that, that he made and what he got correct. And as Alan described, this information at the subskill level is then used to inform instructional observations, which I'll show in just a moment. In this data here, we can see that as the word got longer, Gabriel started to not segment them as, as completely. Let's jump to the instruction. And you'll, you'll, all of this will look familiar to you as Alan just went through, but I'm going to show Gabriel in particular here. And here we have, again, those analyzed subskill patterns. And these are the patterns that were observed with Gabriel. And the teacher is given activities that can be done with Gabrielle specifically, as well as which group Gabrielle would fall into. So we have several small groups identified here, a student that will work on um, phonological awareness, advanced phonological awareness. The group that Gabrielle is in here with his classmate P. Baker is for decoding. And here again in plain English, uh, as Alan mentioned, we have what it is that, uh, that Gabrielle can do, what he needs to work on, what are some ways to do that, the observed patterns and the activities. Similar to how the activities are in Dibble's eighth edition, these are scripted, short, and can be done um, in a group or again, individually. I saw a question in the chat about data was available together side by side. Absolutely. This is what I also previewed um, at the beginning. And what we see here is Gabrielle's dual language report. And we're going to see how Gabrielle performed on the Dibble's eighth edition assessment, as well as on the M-Class Lectura assessment side by side, not just side by side, but what that means. So first, right at the top, immediately, in there's a quick summary in English, Gabriel is developing. On Spanish, he is on track. Okay, but let's learn a little bit more about that. We have a quick summary at the top. Gabriel demonstrates higher performance on Spanish literacy assessment than on English. He is applying strong foundational skills in Spanish to read and comprehend text. He may need additional support in English. Teach Gabriel to apply letter sound knowledge to English and review letter sound correspondences that are similar across both languages pointing out those that are different. So that is the guidance. And we will I will show you more about how actually the teacher is supported in doing those things. First, let's take a look at Gabrielle's results. We have the Dibble's eighth edition results here by, grouped by skill. 
as well as Spanish grouped by skill. And you'll notice that these are not the measure names, they're grouped by skill, but the skills are in common across the languages. These are the foundational literacy skills. The way in which they are measured as we reviewed earlier on the chart is, is a little bit different. It depends on the specific ways in which literacy in that language develops. Let's take a look at that more deeply. So specifically, there are two areas of focus for Gael uh, in terms of supporting his biliteracy. One is phonological awareness. The other is letter sounds and decoding. So let's take a quick look here at phonological awareness. Here, as I mentioned, these are measured differently. In English, this was measured with phoneme segmentation. And in Spanish, this was measure, measured with syllable segmentation. So that information is right here quickly for the teacher to see. Now, this is important because you may have a, you may have a teacher, you may have two different teachers that conducted this assessment. So you may have the English, the, the teacher that's doing English language instruction and the teacher that is doing Spanish language instruction. And this is a great way for them to see what was assessed in the other language exactly. And there's some embedded PD in this report even to help them understand that those results better. For instance, here for phonological awareness, it is further detailed um, in what way Gabriel's phonological awareness skills in Spanish can transfer to English. And there is a document here that the uh, teacher can access for cross-linguistic transfer guidance. This is this document provides explicit information on how uh, what skills trans what aspects of phonological awareness transfer from English to Spanish and Spanish to English as well, as well as what aspects of of the languages don't transfer well and actually may hinder and may confuse um, the student. And in addition to that, the teacher is given uh, specific strategies and tips to embed into instruction. And the same thing with letter sound and decoding here. One moment. So we had, we, we've talked about Gabriel. I also earlier in, 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 in our talk today introduced Tessa. Remember Tessa is a student who uh, speaks English at home and is in the dual language immersion program with Gabriel. So her data may look different. For instance, she's demonstrating higher phonological awareness skills and decoding in English than Spanish. And so during Spanish literacy instruction, the teacher may uh, cho should choose to focus on sounds and letter correspondences that are unique to Spanish, practicing at the syllable and the phoneme level. And so having all of that information at the fingertips for the teachers is exactly what the dual language report uh, allows the, uh, the teacher to do. And so whether you're using Dibble's eighth edition for English literacy or Lectura for Spanish literacy, for both, there are letters that, that the teacher can send home with the student for their parents or caregivers that discuss the student's skills and progress in parent-friendly language. And so the letter, whether the assessment was given in Dibble's eighth edition or in Lectura, both letters are available in English and in Spanish. So Gabriel's parents can read about his results his English results in Spanish and Tessa's parents can read about her Spanish results in English and vice versa. We also have a wide range of reports that we haven't even shown today that are available for administrators from the school level to the district level, fidelity reports that give an understanding of benchmark and progress monitoring completion, performance reports, growth reports, where administrators are able to slice and dice and look at various subpopulations. So we invite you to take a look. There is a reporting guide that you can download from our website and you can take a closer look at these reports. And of course, we would be happy to come and talk with you. Um, if you invite us to speak with you, we can share a lot more about these reports with you. And finally, I want to share about a very exciting event on May 19th. 
Uh, we invite you to join us. We are proud to host our Biliteracy Symposium, an all-day virtual event. We have 2,000 people registered so far, some amazing speakers lined up, including our keynote, Dr. Pedro Nogueira, a leading scholar of urban public education, equity, and school reform, and advocate of bilingual education, Dr. Lillian Duran, who co-developed the Lectura Assessment and has extensively studied Spanish literacy assessment, especially with the youngest learners, Dr. Elsa Cárdenas Hagen, a bilingual speech language pathologist and certified academic language therapist. She's the author of Literacy Foundations for English learners, uh, which is a guide to evidence-based instruction. And there's many more. It's going to be an inspiring, informative, discussion-rich day. You can register on our website, and we have the link right here. Um, we hope you can join us. And with that, I will pause and see what questions you have for us. Hi, Kajal. Uh, we don't have questions in the Q&A box, so I invite everybody, please, to, um, you know, we, we're sure that we were clear, but we still am sure that you're more curious about more. So please ask us questions in the chat or in the, in the Q&A, and, uh, and we'll take it from there. What are you all thinking about? All right, well, thank you everybody. Um, again, even while I'm closing us up, please ask questions. But um, we hope that this was at least entertaining, if not informative, uh, and join us for the Bioliteracy Day. Uh, Serena, um, please go ahead and uh, throw out your question. We're not leaving, even if other people are leaving, we'll stay on for a little while for as many people who have questions. So if, you, if you're running, um, we've got, um, Serena's got a question, and while we're waiting for Serena to type that one out, uh, Michael, love that you love the dual language report, and Jacqueline's asking, are there other bilingual programs in the work? And the answer to that is absolutely yes. So Kajal, tell us a little bit about um, Caminos and what else we're working on, and then we'll come back with some questions about uh, Lectura and Double Eight. Yes, absolutely. So we already have a, um, a, a Caminos, which is our language arts program, and if you have heard of CKLA, it pairs with CKLA. It is the Spanish companion to that, but um, it, it has a knowledge component as well as a skills component. The skills component is launching for 23-24. We're working on it right now, but the knowledge component is available now, and it is a uh, K-5 program. Um, in grades K through two, it is developed, it is divided into knowledge content as well as skills. And then in grades three through five, that would be integrated. Uh, but it is, it's, it really takes the approach of developing knowledge while we're, while literacy is being developed. Um, and we would love to talk with you more about that if you want more information. Hey, uh, thanks, Kajal. We have a question um, from Serena. I'm curious about the reason for letter name assessments in Spanish as opposed to the letter sounds. I know that you've spoken to that many times. That is a great question and a common question. Um, so letter sounds is very important, as you know, and, and we have included it in the assessment, but why is letter names there? Um, and there are really uh, two reasons why letter names is there. First is that we have found that it is still highly predictive in terms of the what it can tell us about a student being at risk uh, for reading difficulty. And the other reason has to do with the relation to dyslexia screening. It is being used as the, rata, uh, the rapid automatized naming measure. Uh, as rapid automatized naming could be measured with letter names or colors or numbers. And with where the research is right now on dyslexia screening in Spanish, which is continuing, um, we felt that letter names was the best was the best measure to use at this time. All right, what else do we have? Serena, you're welcome to ask a follow-up to that if um, Ketchell didn't cover it enough, but I wanna see if anybody else has questions. 
and we'll give it a few moments. Uh, again, thank you everybody for coming today. And yes, you will get the recordings. Please join us for the Bioliteracy Symposium. Uh, and even if you all sign off, we will stay for a little bit uh, longer. Um, Jacqueline asks, is it a K-5 program? Uh, yes. Um, M-Class itself, as well as M-Class um, with both Tibbles 8 and Lectura are K-6. And uh, Caminos, the full biliteracy, bilingual Spanish program is K-5. Um, again, keep working on us. Okay, data assessment. Yes, the data, these assessments produced are incredible. Thank you for that. Um, we just, I do want to acknowledge to everybody that what we try very hard is to find that balance of how do people get that granular, rich, nuanced data in two languages. And for those teachers that do not have the time or the skills or desire to get bogged down, how do we also get them instant instruction and scaffolding? Um, we believe so deeply that this is what makes that time on assessment and that one minute moment um, so valuable to teachers is, is the rich data, the biliteracy uh, and the instruction. So again, thank you everybody. All right, thanks. We're gonna call Thank it a day. You. Take care. Bye everybody.